Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our community talk, What You Need to Know About Colon Cancer. I'm Yuri Ladebaum from the Division of Gastroenterology at Stanford. And I'd like to thank you for coming out on this evening. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And this is part of our effort to reach out to the community and provide information that we hope is important for you. We're aware that often people in the audience are members of families where somebody has had colon cancer. Perhaps somebody in the audience has had colon cancer or rectal cancer or a relative has. There are other people who may be interested in this for general health prevention. So we've gathered a spectrum of people to tell you about the whole span of questions that may come up regarding colon cancer, from prevention to treatment to assessment of families that may be at high risk because of genetic syndromes. Dr. Harold's daughter is a new addition to our gastrointestinal cancer treatment program, oncology, and we're very excited that she will be sharing her expertise with you about treatment for colon cancer. I will talk to you about screening and prevention because colorectal cancer is a cancer that is largely preventable through screening and also detectable at an early stage where treatment is most successful. Courtney Rowe Teeter is one of our genetic counselors who deals with families that may be at high risk for inherited colorectal cancer and other syndromes. And Patrick Swift is a radiation oncologist who deals with rectal cancers as well as other cancers that can happen in other parts of the body. So with this, we hope that you will get a, a spectrum of views and uh, data, information about what might address your initial interest and questions. Now, we know that you will have questions. We thought that the most organized way to do this would be for you to write your questions as we go along, and then we'll save them and we'll have an interactive session at the end where you can ask any or all of us any questions that you might have. So to kick this off, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Harald's daughter, who will speak to you about the oncology or the medical treatment perspective of colorectal cancer. Cece? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here to get to talk to you a little bit about colon cancer treatment and how we have been advancing it in the last few years. And so first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the incidence of colon cancer. So back in the 1940s and 50s, colon cancer was actually the most common cancer in the United States. But fortunately, the incidence of this cancer has been coming down, uh, and it is now the third most common cancer in this country. If we look at mortality numbers, uh, let me see, do I have a pointer here? Yes. Mortality has also been coming down with this cancer, and we think that incidence and mortality uh, decreases are being seen for uh, three main reasons. One is the fact that colonoscopies have been introduced. They were really introduced in the 1990s and really picked up after year 2000. Uh, so we're, we're diagnosing these cancers before they become cancers, removing polyps before they become cancerous and diagnosing them at an earlier stage. We have gotten better treatments here in the last 15 years, which I'll, I'll tell you more about. And then there have been some lifestyle changes uh, with risk factors, which I'll, I'll tell you about. So today, colonoscopies are recommended for people when they hit age 50. And so we've seen a decrease in the incidence of colon cancer in patients older than 50. But for patients younger than 50, uh, where we're not doing uh, routine screening, we have seen an increase in, in the incidence of colon cancer. Uh, and the reasons for the, that remain um, remain unclear. So if we look at the risk factors, uh, we know of certain things that increase risk, perhaps most importantly family history, which Courtney will tell you a little bit more about. So in some cases, colon cancer is clearly associated with inherited cancer syndromes. And in some cases, families have an increased risk for unknown reasons. Um, inflammatory diseases of the, the colon, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, clearly have an increased risk of, of colon cancer development. And then there are other risk factors that are associated with a lower risk, uh, but an increased risk as well. 
And we know that things can also decrease the risk of colon cancer. Most importantly, screening will decrease the risk. But other lifestyle factors such as um, having an active, active uh, lifestyle can decrease the risk. And studies have shown that people who are, uh, you know, remain active, um, do not have obesity, consume alcohol in low amounts and do not smoke, they clearly have a, a decreased risk of developing colon cancer, perhaps 40% decreased risk compared to those who, who don't adhere to these lifestyle um, factors. Now, aspirin has also been shown to decrease the risk, and uh, just recently the U.S. task force recommended aspirin for people over 50 if they have no contraindications to being on a baby aspirin, and it's also good for cardiovascular health. And then we know that people who have a higher vitamin D level in the blood, they do have a decreased risk of colon cancer compared to those who have a low level uh, of vitamin D in the blood. Now, when we look at patients who have been diagnosed with colon cancer and they've had their colon cancer resected and perhaps chemotherapy, um, observational studies have also shown uh, the, the following factors to decrease the risk of recurrence, the risk of the cancer coming back. So I routinely recommend this for my patients to tell them to you know, stay active. This would mean physical activity 30 minutes a week, uh, 30 minutes at a time, three times a week. I tell them to take a baby aspirin if they have no contraindications to that. I also tell them to take vitamin D3, a thousand units a day. Um, to try to eat healthy and avoid uh, gaining weight. Now this brings me to my, my first case I wanted to share with you. So this is a 55-year-old male uh, who presented with constipation and blood in the stool for about three months. He underwent a colonoscopy and that revealed a mass in the left side of the colon. Um, and this was biopsied, confirmed to be colon cancer. He had blood tests and commonly, routinely, we would check for the CEA level, which can be made by the tumor in about 60% of cases. And in his case, it was, it was elevated, meaning we can use it to follow him long term. Um, he has CAT scans of the chest and belly and they reveal no metastatic disease. So he's taken for colon surgery. His left colon is taken out. And then he comes to discuss, uh, ask me whether he should do chemotherapy. We call it adjuvant chemotherapy when we're doing it after surgery, all disease has been removed. And so the most important thing we look at when we're discussing whether to do chemotherapy or not is uh, what stage the disease is at. And so we get that stage from looking at the pathology report and I'll show you a little bit more about how we, we stage colon cancer. Um, and importantly, that CEA level normalized after surgery. So when we look at staging, um, we have four stages in colon cancer. And so here we got the, the colon uh, looking like a tube, the inside and then the outside of the colon. And the inside is covered by a mucosa, followed by a submucosa and then a muscular layer. And then the, the lining on the outside is called the serosa, and then we have lymph nodes. And so if the tumor is growing, it can be growing into the muscle layer, but not through and not involving any of the lymph nodes, it's a stage one colon cancer. And if the tumor grows through the muscle layer, but still not involving any of the lymph nodes, we call it a stage two colon cancer. In stage three, the, the, the tumor is found in the resected lymph nodes. Uh, doesn't really matter how far into the wall it's grown. If lymph nodes are positive, it's stage three disease. And then in stage four disease, the tumors, the, the colon cancer has spread from the place where it started to other organs in the body, and you know, most commonly the liver. So how do we manage uh, the different stages? So in stage one, the main stage really to do surgery. And we know that these patients have a very good prognosis and chemotherapy will not add anything to that after surgery. 
in stage two disease, uh, again, surgery is the mainstay, and this group as a whole has not been shown to benefit from chemotherapy after surgery. But there are certain uh, factors that the pathologist will tell us about that if they are present, you know, these patients might benefit from chemotherapy, and so we definitely discuss that with them. Uh, particularly if the, if the tumor has grown th through the entire colonic wall, meaning it's a T4. If they have lymphovascular invasion or less than 12 lymph nodes resected, and if they have presented with obstructive symptoms or perforation. So in stage three colon cancer, so this is the stage where it's involving the lymph nodes. Um, we know that in uh, about 60% uh, are cured by operation alone. And now I'm, I'm really talking, we have three subcategories of stage three dis disease depending on how many lymph nodes are involved, but this would be true for someone who has one or two lymph nodes involved. Um, and so this is the group where we, we, we routinely offer chemotherapy after surgery. And we know that chemotherapy will add about 15 to 20% to the cure rate of the cancer. Um, the chemotherapy that we, we do for, for everyone is uh, two agents, 5-FU, it's really an old chemotherapy drug, been around for decades, and then oxaliplatin, it's really the 5-FU that does the bulk of the work. And then a certain, about 20% will recur even, even if we do surgery and chemotherapy. And so what we really try to look for are factors that might predict who, who recurs and who does not. Um, uh, and really to try to sort of home in on the group of people who, who would really benefit from chemotherapy. So one of the, the factors that we've um, discovered in, in the most recent years is microsatellite instability or uh, also known as mismatch repair deficiency. And so um, now we stain all tumors for these mismatch repair proteins. If these stains are abnormal, that might mean that the patient has Lynch syndrome, which is an inherited cancer syndrome, and Courtney will tell you more about. Uh, but if, if these proteins are absent, then they, that means that they have a good prognosis, and particularly if they're stage one or two. And so this group of patients, we we would not offer adjuvant chemotherapy to in stage two. Now, there are recurrence risk scores that can be done on the tumors. There are a few on the markets, on the market where they're really looking at um, gene expression in the tumor, and they can predict recurrences. Uh, but the problem with these is that they don't really tell us who benefits from adjuvant therapy and who not. So our national clinical guidelines in oncology, they do not recommend using these recurrence risk scores. Now, for some brand new stuff that's just come up uh, here in the, in the last few months is the CDX2 protein. Um, so there was a study that was done partly at Stanford where they stayed for this protein, and if it was missing, which it did in about 4% of the tumors, that predicted a higher risk of recurrence and, and benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. So I predict that this is something that we'll be incorporating into our practice in the near future. And then circulating tumor cells is sort of a work in progress. Uh, you know, the idea of being able to monitor for circulating tumor cells after surgery is, is appealing um, and definitely being looked at in studies, but too early to bring into clinical practice. So back to our case, uh, so our patient had stage three colon cancer, had been resected, so he received chemotherapy with Folfox for six months. And after he, after he was done, we started a surveillance period where we surveil people for five years, and we, we do that because the risk of recurrence is highest in those five years. Um, and so he, he came in every three months with a visit and blood work where we monitor that CEA level, CAT scans once a year. And 18 months after his initial surgery, the CEA level rose from you know, being uh, normal up to 60. And so he got a CAT scan and here you see the liver. Uh, and here this 
black spot is a metastasis, a liver metastasis. So nothing else found on the CAT scans, and so he really had a, a single metastasis. Uh, so that means he has stage four disease. And it is really important when you see these patients who have isolated liver metastasis to bring the, this discussion to a multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, and that's a, you know, we have such a tumor board at Stanford where we bring in the surgeons and the radiation oncologists. Um, and if these patients are able to undergo surgery, that can really impact their survival. I would say that, um, you know, about 20% of patients will present with metastatic disease initially, uh, and about a third of those will have isolated liver metastasis, and maybe in about a third of cases we can resect them. Sometimes we give chemotherapy before doing such a resection to shrink the tumor, and, and he got chemotherapy for three months. Um, and then he, he went on to have his surgery and is doing well now 24 months after his liver surgery. So what are, are some of the new therapies that we have introduced for metastatic colon cancer, meaning stage four disease in the last few years? So the 5-FU drug is an old chemotherapy drug, been along for a, a long time. Uh, but if we look at the average overall survival from the 80s and to today, um, it has really tripled with the, all these new therapies that have been introduced. Um, you know, the first ones were chemotherapy drugs introduced in 2000 and 2004 to 5. Uh, but here in the last few years, we've really been introducing targeted therapies. Um, and the, the, the most recent addition, Lonserf, is actually a chemotherapy drug that's, that's related to 5-FU. But I think this has really impacted, impacted survival a, a lot. So just to tell you a little bit about the targeted therapy, so we have two main categories. There are therapies that target vascular endothelial growth factor. It really has to do with the blood supply to the tumors. And so now we have four different drugs in that category. Really, these first three we give with chemotherapy. Uh, Regorafenib or Stivarca is given as pills, and it actually has more targets, so we give that by itself. This, the second group of targeted therapies target the endothelial growth factor receptor. Um, cetuximab and panitumumab, they can e either be given as a single agent or with chemotherapy. But they're really only, o they only work if the tumor does not have a mutation in the KRAS and NRAS genes. Um, and that's about 40% of cases does not have those mutations. Now there are liver directed therapies in addition to the patient I told you about who only had that single liver metastasis. So, you know, we, we try to do surgery if we can. Uh, but if we cannot and the disease is isolated to the liver, then we can, uh, there are therapies that just di are directed to the liver, such as ablation and to do embolization procedures in the liver, uh, radiation, and in some cases, some institutions insert an infusion pump that just delivers chemotherapy directly to the liver tumors. And so these are all you know, potential options. I would say it depends on the institution sort of what the, what the, what procedure they, they like. <coughs> then I wanted to spend just the last few minutes to tell you a little bit about immunotherapies. Um, and so in, in the first study that looked at immunotherapies, uh, an immunotherapy called nivolumab, they actually had about 14 patients with colorectal cancer, so more than the in melanoma and lung cancer, where these therapies have, have now been approved for use. And of these 14 colorectal cancer patients, there was really only one patient who responded. Um, and so initially, this was a disappointment, and these therapies sort of moved on in melanoma and lung cancer. But, but when investigators looked at you know, what was different about this one patient, um, they found that that patient <coughs> had uh, an MSI high or microsatellite unstable tumor or a tumor with mismatch repair deficiency. And so what that means is 
if we take the tumor and stain for these poor mismatch repair proteins, you know, one or more of them is missing. Um, in this case, you can see the brown stains signify that the protein is present, but the PMS2 protein is absent. We can see these blue nuclei. So that means the patient may have Lynch syndrome. Uh, doesn't mean 100% of them do, but they could have Lynch syndrome. Uh, we see this in about 4% of, of metastatic colon cancer. But it also means that they could be eligible or could respond well to these immunotherapies. And so another case, so uh, we took care of a, a young lady, a 27-year-old female with Lynch syndrome who had a mutation in the MLH1 gene. She had been diagnosed with right-sided colon cancer with metastasis uh, to several sites. And she had been given our, our standard chemotherapy with Avastin, a targeted agent, uh, really progressed after only a few months uh, on that chemotherapy, so aggressive disease. We started on second line chemotherapy with another targeted agent and again progressed pretty rapidly. Then stains on the tumor showed that these proteins were missing. And so she started a clinical trial with a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, and after three months, the tumors were shrinking. And after another three months, he had had a complete response, meaning we could not see any tumors. Now we treated, uh, several patients have been treated on this trial. Uh, we know that the drug does not seem to cross the blood-brain barrier, so some of them have, have uh, had brain metastasis developed, but they've been able to be resected, and the patients can continue on the therapy. And so this trial is probably the, the most exciting news that we've had in, in colon cancer here in the last year. This was presented and published last May. Um, and so in this trial, they used pembrolizumab, this PD-1 inhibitor immunotherapy. Um, and so for colorectal cancer patients who had one or more of these proteins missing, 40% responded, meaning significant shrinkage in the tumors. Um, the patients who had normal stains did, did not respond, so they do not benefit from the, these therapies, unfortunately. Um, they also had a cohort where patients uh, had different types of cancers but had these mismatch repair proteins missing, and they also had a high response rate. So definitely, the, the, you know, the, we do not want to miss these cases because they benefit from these, this therapy. I think that concludes my talk. Thank you. Very comprehensive. And I'm sure it made some of you think about questions regarding chemotherapy options. So if you have those, please write them down. And we can cover them at the end of the presentations. My, my task is to talk to you primarily about screening and prevention. This is something that, as gastroenterologists, we spend a lot of our time doing, and that's because to a large extent we have the opportunity to prevent a large fraction of colon cancers or to find them early. That's our goal. To remind you, you heard a little bit about colorectal cancer risk factors. Some of these are things that you can do something about. Others are things you cannot do anything about. You can't do anything about your family history to change it. You can potentially manage your risk by doing the appropriate screening. But other risk factors that are more environmental or lifestyle related sometimes don't get enough attention. So I wanted to begin with this slide and emphasize it again. You've seen these factors. Screening is very important. These are also very important. They're hard to measure. So whatever you can do to stay active, to have normal weight, avoid smoking, drink alcohol in moderation, and try to avoid the whole variety of things that can lead to type 2 diabetes that will not only re reduce your risk of colorectal cancer, but of many other diseases. So if you look more broadly, cardiovascular disease is a big threat to all of our health. Other types of cancers are possible as well. So these are much more important than just for colorectal cancer prevention. Let me try to put into perspective a little bit of what I'll tell you regarding screening. And what I mean by that is that most of what I'll discuss are tests that apply to most adults who 
don't have familial colorectal cancer, meaning colon cancer running in the family. We're all at some risk of getting colon cancer, and most colon cancers just happen for reasons that are not terribly obvious. There isn't a very clear genetic cause. There isn't a very clear environmental cause. It's probably a combination of things. In up to maybe a quarter of patients who have colon cancer, it runs in the family. But it's not at a level that we can identify a specific genetic cause, and it's not a tremendously striking family history. What Courtney will talk to you about are the more striking families where there is a gen genetic cause, but also some families where the, the family history is not that striking and there's still a genetic cause. In these cases, there are intensive screening and surveillance recommendations that are different from the general screening recommendations in terms of the types of tests. And also, when colon cancer runs in the family, there are some differences in what is recommended. What do I mean by that? Well, the bottom line is that for people who seem to be at average risk, meaning there's no colon cancer in your family, there's a whole variety of options. CC mentioned colonoscopy. That's very frequently used in the United States. It's also a primary screening test in certain other countries. But it's not the only option, so I wanted to make you aware of that. And there are countries where that is not the primary option for most people, primarily just because of a public health considerations. They do not have the capability to do colonoscopy on everybody, and they think that from a public health measure, it makes sense to go with other tests. So the point is, if you're a little bit squeamish about a colonoscopy, you don't like the idea, that's not the only option for screening. And I'll discuss that in length. But I'm aware that at events like this, as I mentioned, there are often people whose families have had experience with a relative having colon cancer, or there are people who may have had colon cancer themselves. And in that case, generally the test of choice is colonoscopy, because we're dealing with a family where the risk is somewhat higher. So just bear that in mind. In this group, there are other options here. We're generally talking about colonoscopy. And when colonoscopy is the test of choice, the question is, how often? And at what age do you start? And that's adjusted by the level of risk, with risk moving higher as we go towards the genetic syndromes. You saw these curves before. I think it's very exciting that the rate of people getting colon cancer has been decreasing after the age where screening is generally initiated in the 50s. It's not just screening. There are probably risk factors playing a role here. And when you see these types of curves for not the rate of people getting colon cancer, but the rate of people dying from colon cancer, the pattern is similar, but some of the benefit is due to better treatments. So we're really talking about changes in screening patterns having benefit, uh, higher and higher success rates in treatment, and also changes in risk factors. But the risk factor story is a bit complicated because as Cece pointed out, the numbers in the young are going up. Now, I I'll caution you that the numbers here are much smaller than for, for these other age groups. You see this is from one to seven out of 100,000 people. So colon cancer in people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, is still pretty rare. But the trend is going up. And we know that it's not genetics changing at this rate. So there's something else. And the question is, what is it? But it's probably something environmental. We're not sure if it's as straightforward as obesity or diet. We don't know. But the question is whether this is happening only in the background for younger people, or whether this is also happening for older people, in which case we would expect this not to be flat without screening, but to be going up. And then maybe screening is having more of an effect than you would have guessed, because it's dropping it from a trend that would otherwise be going up. It's a little hard to know. The main point of this is that we think screening does have an important impact, even if it doesn't explain the whole thing. And in the background, at least in younger people, there seem to be some factors going in the wrong direction. Now, what is unique about screening for colon cancer? In a sense, screening for colorectal cancer is, is really not the right name for what we're engaging in doing. Because we're screening not only for cancer, we're screening for cancer and precancers. And that's a little unique in, in the world of cancer. There are other cancers for which screening is established. But primarily, what one is hoping to find is an early cancer when it's most treatable and most curable but not so much a precancer where cancer is preventable. In colorectal cancer, we do have the opportunity 
to try to prevent a large fraction of colorectal cancers. And the reason is that most cancers grow up from polyps. Not all polyps go on to be cancer. So if some of you have had a colonoscopy and your doctor told you your polyp was precancerous. That may have a whole range of how, how true that really is. Many of the tiny little polyps that are taken out might have had a chance of going on to cancer over a long period of time, but the reality is that most polyps never go on to cancer. The larger, the more complicated polyps are, the higher risk that they will go on to cancer. We can't tell necessarily when we're doing a colonoscopy which is really a worrisome polyp, so we tend to take them all out. When we do that, we know that we can decrease the risk of that person getting cancer in the first place. And there's very good evidence from very, very large studies with some of the other tests that I'll show you, where patients who have had screening compared to patients who have not had screening, when they follow them for many years, there is benefit in terms of lower rates of colon cancer and lower rates of dying from colon cancer. So there's very strong evidence behind this. Most, most of the cancers then, if we can actually look before they develop cancer and we find the whole progression of the lesion at the polyp stage, we can remove that and potentially prevent the cancer from happening in the first place. The majority of cancers come from polyps that are called adenomas. More recently, there's been a recognition of a different type of polyp, and these go to cancer through two different molecular pathways. The details are not that important, but the main point is that our attention to what we're looking for in the colon has shifted a little bit to look for some of these other lesions. First, we know that not all adenomas are the, this very classic picture of a mushroom or, or a little shrub type appearance where you have a stalk and then a head for the polyp. The polyp is here. The stalk usually doesn't have polyp tissue. And if we remove this polyp at the neck here, the whole polyp is gone. That's the pedunculated or polyp with a stalk. But most polyps don't look like that. In the very extreme are these different types of polyps that I mentioned, the serrated polyps, which can be extremely subtle. And in this picture, the polyp is here. It's very, very hard to see. It's almost completely flat. And the only clue to this is that sometimes mucus clings to this a little bit. And you can see that the blood vessels that are very sharp here and pretty obvious begin to kind of fall away here. Here, you lose it, it's coming here, and then it goes away. It's very hard to see, so we need to pay very close attention. There are special ways that we can try to enhance this with lighting during colonoscopy. This begins to get at the fact that tests like colonoscopy are very good, the technology is very good, but as with anything, it's operator dependent. Some surgeons have better outcomes than others, and some medical oncologists will give you better advice than others, and so on. That's true for colonoscopy as well. So what we can do when we, when we suspect that there's something there is we can inject with salt water and a little uh, dye to actually see this better. And you can see this brings it out very nicely. You can see the edge of this, of this flat polyp. And having raised it, we can also then remove it with a little lasso-type electrical cautery snare. So the point is, most colon cancers begin from adenomas. Some adenomas are flat. I didn't show you that, but those can be hard to see too. A smaller number of cancers are from the serrated lesions, which are often flat and subtle. And I think as a community, gastroenterologists have gotten better and better at recognizing the whole range of lesions that could potentially go into cancer and try to find them and take them out. So how can we help prevent colon cancer? Well, first, Lifestyle factors, as I discussed before. But as I keep stressing, many cancers could be prevented with regular screening. What is screening? Screening is testing to find a disease in people who have no symptoms. This is extraordinarily important. I just saw a very interesting report in the, in the news hour about communities in Appalachia that have a very high rate of cancer for a variety of reasons. And they interviewed a family and the wife of a patient who had had symptoms of cancer for many, many years was asked, and have you ever had screening tests? In this case, they were talking about colonoscopies. And she said, no. She, she had been pointing out how her husband ignored the symptoms for so long. Have you had screening? No. She was of screening age. She was over 50. Why not? I've never felt anything. But that's not the point of screening. 
the whole point of screening is to look when you don't have symptoms. Often when you have symptoms, things have progressed to a point that is more advanced and it's ideal to find things earlier, particularly in, in colorectal cancer at the pre-cancer stage, at the polyp stage. Why screen? To find and remove polyps before they can become cancer. But the other very important thing is to find colorectal cancer early when it's smallest and has not spread or when the spread has been as limited as possible. You saw from CC that the treatment options for cancer that has spread have expanded. I think those are incredibly exciting developments. But if we could choose, we would still prefer to find things early. So even if we can't prevent all colon cancers, if we find cancer at a stage where surgery alone is curative, that's better. Because if we can spare the patient needing chemotherapy, that's ideal. How is colorectal cancer screening done? Well, there are different types of tests for colorectal cancer screening, and you can think about them two different ways. There are some that are very good at finding both polyps and colorectal cancer. You saw the example of colonoscopy. So colonoscopy would be the gold standard test for finding the most possible things. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the gold standard screening test for everybody. And different experts will tell you different things about this. I will say, though, as I mentioned before, that in very high-risk subgroups, strong family history, and especially the genetic syndromes, with, which Courtney will tell you about, members of those families should have colonoscopy. There are other tests that mainly find cancer. And you might say, well, isn't it better to prevent? Absolutely. But for somebody who is deciding between different options and says, I'd rather not have colonoscopies, I'd rather have other things, and if we find cancer at an early stage, it's curable with surgery, that's acceptable to me, that's fine. From, from my perspective, the most important thing is that people consider some form of screening. And for those who are not enthusiastic about colonoscopy, it's better to do something than nothing. And it's fair to say that a program of colonoscopy could be comparable to a program of really good stool-based screening. And, and I'll tell you about that. It's just a matter of sticking with it in the required protocol. So this is, this is a colonoscope. A shorter version of lower, lower endoscopy is sigmoidoscopy, which looks primarily at the left side of the colon. That's not as common in the US anymore as a standalone strategy, because we know that things can be missed in the right side of the colon. The stool-based tests have different varieties. Some are based on cards, where you, you take a little smear of stool, put it in the card, mail it away, and then the lab develops it with, with a developing solution. Others are based on little brushes or other types of devices where you scrape a little bit of the stool um, after you've collected it. It goes in a container like this, and the whole thing, when it's sealed up, looks like that. And there, there are some uh, systems, health systems, that actually have a mail-in program for this. Their, their members get this mailed to them. They collect it at home, mail it in. A more recent development has been a, an enhancement of stool-based screening that includes also some DNA testing. So they're looking both for blood in the stool and for genetic changes. I should clarify that these tests look for hidden blood in the stool. So polyps or cancers can bleed uh, at an amount that you don't see. But if we test for hidden blood, that is a pretty good signal that there may be cancer there. There also could be other things. It could be a false positive. But when we colonoscope people who have had positive results on these tests, our rate of finding polyps, finding cancer is much higher than in people who have no blood in the stool. So this is, this is a, a well-established screening method. And as I mentioned before, some public health systems in Europe and Asia lead with these types of tests. The stool DNA test includes one of these tests, the stool uh, immunochemical test, fecal immunochemical test. It, it tests for hemoglobin with an immune reaction. That, plus some genetic changes, actually increases the rate of finding polyps in cancer. It's got a different collection method, and it's sent overnight. And another possibility is to screen with a special type of CAT scan, CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy, where very high resolution images can be made, and also even three-dimensional reconstructions, where, where the assessor has the sense of flying through the colon and looking for polyps. So there are options. Colonoscopy is one of them, but not the only one. So tests that are good at detecting both polyps and cancer include sigmoidoscopy, which is the short version of the scope exam, colonoscopy, which looks at the entire colon. An older test, double contrast barium enema, is not done that often anymore. This requires injection of, of um, a, a barium so a solution that's usually given from below, and then air. So that's the double contrast. 
Much more commonly now, there's CT colonography where people drink a PrEP and then some air, is, air or carbon dioxide is put in from below. This has pretty much replaced double contrast barium enema, but it's not done that often. These tests look inside the colon, either actually or virtually, to find abnormal areas. You saw how subtle some of the truly flat polyps can be. For that reason, the radiographic tests probably are not that good at, at those lesions. But we know we can also miss them at colonoscopy, so we have to pay a lot of attention. The, the endoscopic tests use a lighted tube. You saw the colonoscope. It's put in through the rectum. The other tests use special x-ray. The advantage of, of colonoscopy is that if polyps are found, they can be removed right then and there. Any other test that has an abnormality, for instance, blood in the stool, as I'll talk about in a second, or if the CT colonography is abnormal, that should prompt a colonoscopy. Because if you don't follow it up, then you're not doing anything about the thing that you found. These, according to the American Cancer Society, which provided these slides, these tests are preferred if they're available and if a person's willing to have them. I'll tell you that not everybody will say that these are necessarily preferred. So I try to give a very balanced presentation saying that colonoscopy is a great test. It's not the only one. And if people choose a systematic stool screening program with the right test, that can be just as good. There are some issues of, of adherence. Are you really going to do it every year? But if that's what you prefer, I think that's acceptable. Colonoscopy. So we put in the, the thin tube through the anus into the colon. The rectum is this section here. This is the left colon or the sigmoid and descending. Cece told you about a patient with a sigmoid cancer. That's here. This is the transverse colon. This is the ascending colon or the right side of the colon. And we know that cancers tend to show up in between colonoscopies. In other words, we think people should be protected from a colon cancer. They tend to show up in the right colon more. And that may be because we've missed or haven't taken out completely some of the more subtle lesions like the one that I showed you. So we've become much more aware that we need to be careful here. Um, sigmoidoscopy really has very good benefit, but just in the area that it covers. And that's the justification for considering full colonoscopy. The strongest data for benefit are actually available for sigmoidoscopy and for the card-based method that I showed you. Those are the tests that have been shown in very large studies with many thousands of people followed for many years to have a lower rate of getting cancer and dying from colon cancer. The newer tests, the fecal immunochemical test and colonoscopy, have a lot of data behind them that is observational. We've observed this. But people haven't necessarily randomized people to one group or the other. Those studies are ongoing. But we extrapolate from the other studies. And we think there's very good justification for colonoscopy and the immunochemical test. But in terms of telling you the hard data, it's for sigmoidoscopy and for the smearing stool cards. That's where the best data are. So when we do colonoscopy, we can take the, the polyps away from any areas that, that we see them. This is an example of one of these polyps with, with a stalk. We are putting a snare around it here, which is like a little lasso that has closed around it. And then what's left over afterwards is part of the stalk where the polyp hasn't grown into that stalk. And a polyp like this has a fair chance of having a little area where cancer has begun or where there's high-grade dysplasia, meaning about as precancer as you can get. And over a certain number of years, something like this has a very, very reasonable chance of going on to cancer. So when we find something like this and remove it in a person who still has many years ahead to live, there's a very good chance that this was a prevented colon cancer. CT colonography, as I mentioned, reconstructs polyps in, in a three-dimensional view as well as a two-dimensional view. And expert radiologists can find polyps at, at rates that are as good as good colonoscopists for polyps that peak up from the lining. For the flat polyps, probably not, not as good. But this, this is a reasonable option for people who, who choose to go with this. Now, there are other tests that mainly find cancer when you test the first time. And that's the fecal to gold blood test, the FOBT, the, the older um, variety of the blood test for, uh, of the test for blood in the stool, but the one that has these many randomized trials with large populations. The fecal immunochemical test is a newer version that is better at picking up cancers and polyps, and it's more specific, meaning it's less likely to give you a false positive. You're less likely to be told you need a colonoscopy 
when you are reality, your colon doesn't have anything serious in it. So most programs that rely on stool-based testing have gone to the FIT, the fecal immunochemical test. The stool DNA test is the newer test. This one has a better pickup rate for cancer than FIT and also a better pickup rate for advanced polyps than FIT. But it's more expensive and its place in general practice is still trying to be determined. How enthusiastic practitioners are going to be to go with a program of this is not clear. The current recommendation is that FIT should be done every one to two years. In the US, it's every year in most places. Same with FOBT. The stool DNA test can be maybe every three years. I showed you colonoscopy before. If colonoscopy is normal, the recommendation is to do it every 10 years. So there is a question there of how often can you adhere with a program. And then sigmoidoscopy, if you do it, it's five to 10 years and ideally combined with a FIT test. Now when we find polyps, then patients enter what we call surveillance. We no longer call it screening. Those patients are at higher risk of having more polyps down the road. And how frequently we, we recommend surveillance depends on the size and number of polyps. Some patients come back at five years, some at three. The very high risk patients with Lynch syndrome, which you keep hearing about, which is a genetic syndrome of very high risk, which we keep saying Courtney will tell you about, and she will. In, in those cases, we recommend colonoscopy every one to two years in some families starting in their 20s. So that's the whole spectrum. You can be an average risk person starting at 50. If you have no polyps, your colonoscopy can be every 10 years, or the stool-based test can be every one to two years. If you have polyps, every three to five. I left out from what I said before. If you have family history, we often start in the 40s as opposed to in the 50s. So for instance, start at 40. And even if no polyps, we'll do the colonoscopy every five years. And then for patients who have a lot of polyps, maybe every three years, in the very high risk patients every one to two. So these tests look for stool, uh, our tests of stool, they look for hidden blood or other changes, DNA changes here that may be a sign of cancer. They're getting better at finding polyps. Realize that if you miss a polyp at year three of your program, most of them won't go into a cancer between year three and year four. And at year four, the stool tests have a chance of finding it again. So the cumulative find rate for polyps is better than the wind time rate. And ultimately, the program can do pretty well at finding early cancers as well as polyps. Overall, they probably are less likely to find polyps than, than the other types of tests that I showed you before. And very importantly, you, you, you cannot completely avoid a colonoscopy if you are talking about prevention or even diagnosis for biopsy because any of these tests, if they're abnormal, they lead to colonoscopy. So, in summary, your options include stool-based screening. This is for the average risk person. It would start at 50 and generally recommended to be done every one to two years. And these are the guidelines. 50, both men and women, should begin regular screening and have one of the screening tests listed here. The tests that find both polyps and cancer, as we've discussed, sigmoidoscopy every five to 10 years or in combination with uh, one of the stool-based tests. Colonoscopy every 10 more often if you find polyps. Double contrast barium minima, we hardly ever do anymore, but CT colonography would be every five. The stool-based tests every year for the FOBT, every year for FIT. Stool DNA test current recommendations are three years, but there isn't a lot of data here. So my main message to you is that if you're at average risk, you should consider a program of those. People who are at higher risk, cancer runs in the family, a father, mother, brother, sister who've had colon cancer, especially at an early age, talk to your doctor about when you should start. Colonoscopy is probably the right test for you then, and we probably begin at 40 or another age, often 10 years before the youngest cancer in the family. Uh, there are specific guidelines for people at, at, at high risk, and here the test is colonoscopy. With that, I will turn now to Courtney. Oh, actually, so let me just finish with, with this. Uh, don't focus too much on the specific numbers here. You saw that the, the, that the long-term survival rates for cancer that has spread have become better than some of the older data here. This is what, what CC showed you. So don't focus so much on the specific numbers, but the message is that when we find cancers early, if, if we do the next, be next, best, next best thing to prevention, which is early detection, when we find things early, most patients are cured when things have spread to lymph nodes. The majority of patients are cured, but there are some who do have recurrent disease. When cancer has spread, there is unfortunately 
a, a reasonable number of patients who, whose cancer cannot be completely eliminated. They can be helped in many ways. Many more are being cured, but from the screening and prevention perspective, we want to prevent or find things early. What can you do to prevent colon cancer? You saw the, the lifestyle measures. We talked about screening. And when, when you need treatment, there's a whole variety of options, and we're talking about those today. What's this medal for, Grandpa? I survived a VA colonoscopy. <laughs> it's not that bad. OK, next, Courtney will tell us about the high-risk syndromes that can run in families and, and the changing landscape and how we're approaching high-risk patients. A lot of pressure to talk about Lynch syndrome here. I promise I will. Um, we'll talk through, though, I'm going to really talk about hereditary cancer in general, and we will touch on Lynch syndrome, um, but you'll understand by the end of the talk why this has become a broader talk about hereditary cancer syndromes in general because of the changes in our testing approach. So I'll talk a basic genetics review so we have an understanding about the genetics in general and genetics of cancer. The changing um, landscape, we'll talk about sporadic versus hereditary cancer. It's been touched on before. Um, and end with the importance of involving a genetics professional who kind of understands how this testing works, what kind of information it can provide for you. So basic genetics review. Um, if we think about our bodies as made of trillions of cells, they all contain the set of structures that we call chromosomes, which package our genetic information in the form of genes. And the genes provide the instructions for how our bodies grow, develop, and function. And the genes are made up of the smaller subunit DNA. So genes can be thought of as thousands and thousands of DNA letters long. And the genes I want to point out that we test for in the hereditary cancer clinic are considered tumor suppressor genes. So when they're spelled and working correctly, they're actually helping to prevent cells from growing out of control. Now the genes provide the instructions. Um, to make what we call proteins. And these were touched on before, these mismatch repair proteins and the staining that Cece was talking about before with these Lynch syndrome proteins. Um, so the proteins are physically doing the work. So if the genes are spelled correctly and the proteins are working the way they should, they're helping to prevent tumors from forming. If we were to open up a cell and look under the microscope, we as humans have 46 chromosomes coming in 23 pairs. I make this point because it's important to understand that we get half of each pair from mom and half of each pair from dad. So family history of all types of cancers um, on both sides of the family is important. It's a bigger point when we talk about um, breast and gynecologic cancers, that a father's family history of that is just as important as it is if, as if it's on your mom's side. So this was presented in a slightly different format earlier, but this idea that the majority of cancers that Dr. Laudabon was talking about um, is in the sporadic side, so is not, ha does not have anything to do with inherited genetics. They're happening completely by chance, and we're going to compare that in a moment to this hereditary piece, where we think only about 5 to 10 percent of colon cancers have an actual hereditary underlying cause. So a single gene mutation that's really conferring a significantly higher risk for colon as well as potentially other cancers, depending on which gene we're talking about. And then there's this familial piece where maybe we've ruled out the hereditary causes we know about, but there's more than a fair share of colon cancer in the family. So we think there's likely some genetic factor involved, um, perhaps environmental, shared environmental factors as well, but we can't pinpoint a single underlying cause through genetic testing. But again, this is the category where we would be thinking about colonoscopy as the screening um, tool of choice, and we'd be modifying um, age to start and the frequency depending on the gene or depending in the context of the specific family history. I'll point out here is Lynch syndrome. It is the most commonly common known hereditary cause for um, colon cancer, and we will look at the, the risks associated with that in more detail. Now, it's quite helpful to compare the sporadic versus hereditary, actually, to understand why hereditary cancers are different and why it's important to recognize that that's present in the family. So if we talk about the development of sporadic cancer first, what we typically expect for these various tumor suppressor genes, including these Lynch syndrome genes, 
is for someone to inherit two working copies of these various genes, one of each from mom and one of each from dad in every cell of the body. Over the lifetime of a single colon cell, if one copy of one of these tumor suppressor genes were to become damaged, so a random chance acquired mutation in the cell, there is still one working copy available. And that is actually enough for that tumor suppressor role to still be performed. So we're actually okay in this scenario. It would take a second chance mutation in that same cell, in that second copy or backup copy of the gene, to start down the pathway of tumor development. So we kind of boil it down to this idea of kind of two hits to start towards tumor development. Again, that's a cancer that happens by chance. When we compare it to the development of hereditary cancer, we're talking about someone in most cases at birth inheriting in every cell of their body one non-working copy of one of these genes. So from the get-go, there's only one working copy available. Again, we're okay in this scenario, one working copy is enough, but it's only going to take one chance mutation in that cell to start us down the pathway towards tumor development. So as a result, we often see in hereditary cancer families younger ages of diagnosis because there is less time involved in this process. Um, and sometimes we can see individuals with two separate cancers. That can be a red flag, particularly if it's the same type of cancer or associated cancers. And then also this leads into the idea of how these hereditary cancer syndromes, how most of them are inherited. And most of them are inherited in this dominant manner where, uh, for example, if I carried a gene mutation that I knew put me at higher risk for specific cancers, with every child I would have, male or female, there'd be a 50% chance that I could pass on the non-working copy of the gene I have, but also a 50% chance that I could pass on the working copy. So it's truly a flip of a coin when we're talking about this, uh, the chance for uh, inheritance of these gene mutations. And importantly, identifying that someone has a gene mutation does not mean they have a cancer diagnosis. This means that we know that they're at higher risk than someone in the general population to develop the associated cancers. Now there are a few um, hereditary cancer syndromes, and there's a hereditary colon cancer syndrome that actually has recessive inheritance. We're actually carrying one non-working copy, and the specific gene is mute YH, that confers a very moderate increase in colon cancer risk. However, if an individual inherits two non-working copies, so both copies of the mute YH gene are not functioning correctly, it confers a significant risk for colon polyps and colon cancer, where we look at earlier and much more frequent colonoscopy screening. So I just want to point out this is one of most of the things we talk about in hereditary cancer are dominant inheritance, but in hereditary colon cancer, we do end up sometimes talking about recessive inheritance. I want to talk through the types of results we can get out of genetic testing, and we'll again talk about how things have changed here, but this applies to whether we're talking about um, testing a single gene, um, testing for genes in a single syndrome, or if we're testing for a panel of 40 plus genes, which we'll, we'll talk here in a moment. First possibility is a positive result. So where we find a clear pathogenic mutation, we know that misspelling or mutation in that gene that's identified. Um, causes that gene not to function the way it should, okay? So we know that that's increasing the risk for the cancers associated with that gene. And that's um, the goal is to identify that so that we are aware of those risks and we can be proactive about instituting earlier screening or preventative measures. That's the ultimate goal. We could get a negative result, which means we find no uh, misspellings, no mutations in any of the genes analyzed. Um, ultimately, we talked about that familial piece of the pie. There's some unknown hereditary causes that it doesn't always let the family off the hook in terms of elevated risk. If there's significant family history, that's still gonna inform uh, age and how frequently we look at screening in a family. Third possibility is an uncertain result. If we think about analyzing these genes as reading DNA letter by letter, it's the idea of typically one letter of DNA is swapped out for a different letter. So it's truly a minor variation in the gene that at this moment in time, we don't have enough information about that specific variation to understand if it causes an increase in risk or not. The important thing to know is mentally be prepared going into testing that that's a possibility. Um, but then 
importantly, that the majority of these actually, given time, learning more, having the understanding about them, actually get downgraded to negative results. Only rarely do we see uncertain results get um, reclassified in the positive direction as we learn more. So we ultimately lump these together in terms of how we would manage those families. And so we, we really, those uncertain results, we wouldn't test family members for it and we wouldn't change someone's management based on an uncertain finding. So specifically using Lynch syndrome as an example of why we would want to identify this in the family. Um, we know uh, we've been testing for Lynch syndrome a long time, so we have a clearer handle on what these lifetime risks are. So again, these are overall lifetime cancer risks. So for colon cancer, it actually depends on the gene. So MLH1 and MSH2 are higher risk genes that if you inherit a mutation, colon cancer risk is anywhere from 40 to an 80% lifetime risk, which I want to point out is for someone who had a Lynch syndrome gene mutation and was not doing the intensive screening. So as um, Dr. Laudabaum pointed out, um, if we're doing the screening, the whole goal is we can actually help prevent a majority of those cancers. A little bit lower risk for MSH6 than PMS2. Um, endometrial or uterine cancer is the other higher risk cancer associated with Lynch syndrome. Um, ovarian cancer and other gynecologic cancers, so women kind of get the short end of the stick in regards to this cancer syndrome here. Um, Gastric cancer can also be, risk can be elevated, so we sometimes look at upper endoscopy screening. Um, for women, um, ultimately after childbearing is complete, we uh, talk about the option of preventative surgery to actually help um, prevent the risk of those cancers. And there's um, several other cancer types that are overall lower lifetime risk, but we can sometimes see these in the spectrum of uh, these uh, Lynch syndrome families that might, um, we might tailor screening based on the family history. But again, the whole goal is to know about these risks ahead of time before a cancer develops so we can be proactive about getting ahead of that risk. So I want to touch on the changing landscape of genetic testing. We used to really focus on look at the family history and what is the most likely gene to explain the history. We test for those genes or that syndrome. If we didn't find an answer, in some cases, maybe we would test for another gene and another gene. What's really changed is this idea of panel testing. So in testing technology now allows in a single test that we could analyze, really the list could be as long as, as you want for genes that we know to test for, um, where instead of going sequentially in a single test, simultaneously we can test these genes. And this just is here to show that there are different cancer types, breast, ovarian, colon, uterine, pancreatic, and other encompassed over here where the, these cancers are associated with inheriting muta mutations in these various hereditary cancer or tumor suppressor genes. And there is such significant overlap between what these can look like so that, you know, sometimes we'll see a family and perhaps there's history of um, these types of cancer on one side and history of different types of cancer on the other, where the beauty of panel testing is we can cast that really wide net on the front end and make sure that we're not missing a mutation that might explain one side of the family history or the other. And we're starting to be able to include some newly recognized um, hereditary colon cancer genes as well. And so some of the genes we test for, we, ha we uh, have tested for a long time, we have a lot of clear data about it. Um, other genes are really newly, newly are we offering testing, so our understanding about them isn't as clear cut, but is growing exponentially and growing pretty quickly, our understanding. So I already was kind of touching on this, that the benefits of panel testing are these families where, well, on these pieces, it could look like Lynch syndrome, these pieces, maybe it actually looks like hereditary breast ovarian cancer. It's become much more cost effective to do than the sequential testing approach. Um, we certainly have been surprised when we look at wider panel testing that these families, we thought, oh, all Lynch families look this way. Well, sometimes they don't look as classic like Lynch as we thought they did. Um, rarely, we sometimes find families with two syndromes in it. Um, the drawbacks really, the, the wider we go, the higher the chance for an uncertain finding. So that's something to keep in mind going into testing. Um, and then again, identifying a gene in a more, uh, mutation in a gene that's more recently identified. So we may not have a clear cut um, understanding of the exact lifetime risks and our discussion of management is likely to be more evolving. And every once in a while we get an unexpected positive result in a gene that's high risk that 
really kind of came out of left field, which can be difficult to process, but at the same time is good information to know so that we can move forward with how to protect that individual. Finally, I want to talk through um, the importance of having a genetics provider involved. Um, things have gotten, um, I think, well, in some ways easier because we just cast a wider net and we're not saying, well, let's do this gene versus this gene, but it's more in the understanding of what this information can provide um, and that the, the results on many levels can be more complicated on the back end then. Um, really understanding what these um, uncertain um, results are, being able to look at those and critically think about those. Um, insurance considerations, genetic counselors are very familiar with insurance uh, types, are there specific laboratories that are better to go to, kind of that, the logistical process of it. Um, again, the complexity of the results, especially with panel testing, and that we really view the family as the patient, so we understand, well, the person in front of us is the one looking at testing, this has implication for the rest of the family, and we really take that into consideration in helping that individual um, facilitate communication to the rest of the family. Very quickly, the types of things that are red flags to us, early age of diagnosis I mentioned, so pretty much any one with colon cancer under the age of 50 we would think about, or we talked about these um, stainings that are done for these Lynch proteins on the tumors, that can suggest Lynch syndrome is more likely, so that's another thing. Um, if we've got a significant number of colon polyps, 10 is usually this threshold where we look at testing. Um, ovarian cancer at any age, I'm getting into things other than colon, but uh, male breast cancer, some of these rarer diagnoses where there's a higher chance for an underlying hereditary cause. Clearly, if there's a known pathogenic mutation in the family, we want to be able to test for that specific mutation. That's the ultimate goal. Know about that risk, be able to stratify risk for the other family members through testing, and get on the appropriate screening. Take home message is that um, we really are, the goal is to clarify future cancer risk for the individual we're testing for and to clarify the risk for the family members with the ultimate goal of either early detection or completely preventing a cancer. Um, we're going to continue to whoops, improve identifying hereditary cancer families with this broader panel testing. We're getting a much better understanding. Um, and you know, if you're sitting out there and thinking, should I talk to a genetic counselor? Then maybe the answer is yes, and it's worth talking to your providers and asking for a referral. Even if you've had testing in the past, say you had Lynch testing, it was negative, it might be worth looking at this wider panel testing approach at this point. Thank you. I'll field questions at the end with everyone else. Thanks for your patience tonight. It's getting kind of late, so I will keep this very short. Um, I'm here wearing two different hats, and do we have the slides? Okay. Um, one of the hats I'm wearing is I'm the medical director of the new Stanford Cancer Center South Bay that's opened up here at the corner of Los Gatos Boulevard and uh, Samaritan Drive. It's uh, basically a one-stop shop for cancer care so that for patients that have colon cancer or rectal cancer that have their surgery done either at Stanford or at another facility, here is a facility where uh, Courtney is actually working. We have two full-time genetics counselors and are about to bring on a third. We have two brand new state-of-the-art linear accelerators for the delivery of radiation. We have a three Tesla MR scan, a PET CT scan, a CT scan, mammography. We've got two operating rooms. And upstairs on the fourth floor, we have 22 bays, private bays for the delivery of chemotherapy. So for patients that do get to the point where they've got the diagnosis of colon cancer, for instance, or rectal cancer, we have the ability to now give the treatment much closer to your home and save you that miserable 20-mile ride up 280 to Palo Alto. Um, but we, we are all Stanford. We are all Stanford professors and physicians that are working there, and the facilities are meant to bring it closer to your home. Now, my other hat is a radiation oncologist, and as a radiation oncologist, I tend to deal with colon cancer dealing with the last 15 centimeters of the colon, called the rectum, or for patients that have disease that spread to another part of the body. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about the fact that in the last, it was 31 years ago that we found that the use of radiation actually improves the outcome for patients that have rectal cancer. Um, in those days, back in the 1980s when I was trained, we were treating patients for the five to six week period, just with radiation alone after surgery. In the subsequent years, through multiple studies, we learned that we could improve the outcome with the use of chemotherapy. 
And then about 20 years ago to 15 years ago, people started asking a different question. Can we be giving the radiation and chemotherapy in a different sequence to improve the outcome and to reduce the toxicity for patients? So we started shifting towards preoperative radiation and chemotherapy. And for many patients now with rectal cancer, we will give radiation beforehand. One of the really beautiful things about that is that we can lower the risk that a person's gonna need a permanent colostomy. By giving the radiation and chemotherapy beforehand, we can shrink the tumor down and make it easier for the surgery to get out the tumor and avoid the use of a permanent colostomy. Probably the most exciting stuff is taking place right now though. We have the PROSPECT trial that's under, underway. We're not sure that everybody needs radiation with these stage two and three, stage three disease. So we're trying to identify those patients. So it's a large multinational study that's taking patients, half the patients will be, get it, be getting radiation and chemotherapy, which is the standard treatment. Half the patients um, before surgery will just get a more intensive form of chemotherapy. And at the end of that intensive form of chemotherapy, if they've had a great response, we'll ask the question, can we avoid radiation? I'm one of these physicians that's in a field that eventually I hope I'm completely unnecessary because radiation has a hell of a lot of toxicity both in the short term and the long term. My whole career has been designed to try and figure out ways to minimize that toxicity. We've also, due to our technological developments, been able to move from a five to six week course of treatment now down to treating in just five days for certain people. So um, over the next couple of years, what you will see is that less and less people will get radiation they will be treated with a more safe form of radiation and it will be treated in a very short period of time. Um, at the far end of the disease, when the disease has come back and it's spread, uh, what uh, CC was talking about with stage four disease, some patients with colon cancer or with rectal cancer will have disease in the lung, they'll have it in the spine, they'll have it in the brain, they'll have it in the liver. Um, with the introduction of all these new targeted therapies, we found that those things are no longer a death knell for people and that we have the ability to try and target them very safely with high doses of radiation and improve the outcomes for people, keep them alive longer and keep them very functional for a lot longer period of time. Uh, back when we started with radiation back in the 1980s, we were bathing the whole pelvis with radiation. In order to treat the area, we didn't have the ability to be sophisticated in the delivery, so the entire pelvis was given radiation. So if any of you here had family members that were treated 20 years ago, you know that they had pretty severe side effects afterwards. We have now moved towards something called intensity modulator radiation that allows us to really cone down the radiation and minimize the radiation exposure to nearby tissues. That reaches its height in patients that have colorectal liver metastases where instead of treating um, with a broad beam, we can really pinpoint the beam using our new linear accelerators to give a treatment that can be done in a matter of minutes to a very small portion of the liver. So for instance, this is a patient that's similar to one of the ones that Cece showed earlier that was not considered to be surgically resectable because of its central location in the liver. We were able to give highly, highly targeted radiation. It was given as five treatments over the course of a week, and this patient is out three years with disease control at that point. Um, very well tolerated to the point where the patient gets the treatment, the patient can go out to dinner that night because there's so little side effects associated with it. Um, here's an example of a patient that had colorectal cancer. On the bottom two slides, you see a PET scan. This is the tumor that's in the liver prior to treatment. It was given stereotactic treatment. Here's the, treat here's the field six weeks later. The tumor has been a, a pretty much eradicated. When it was repeated at six months, there was no evidence of the tumor there. So the goal here is to try and minimize the side effects we're going to give patients, keep their disease under control so that CC's new agents can buy us years and years and years more time for patients. Uh, one of my favorite patients is a guy I'm taking care of now who was originally diagnosed with colon cancer 40 years ago. He's had multiple spots show up in his lungs. He's had multiple shot spots show up in his liver. And each time one pops up, we take care of it. And he's got an excellent quality of life. And he's going to die of something else. He's not going to die of his colon cancer. So the evolution of radiation is that we have been able to, through technological developments, better define who really needs radiation. Not everybody needs it early, but there are going to be a lot of cases where we might be able to improve the outcome, avoid colostomies with the use of radiation. Um, those technological advances are improving every day. It's hard to keep up in this field with the, the major changes that have taken place. Uh, we are working on changing the timing of the radiation and chemotherapy to reduce toxicity, and we're trying to make sure that we can control areas that show up 
so that a person can benefit from all these systemic therapies that are being looked at right now. So I'm going to turn it over back over to Yuri at this point because, as I said, radiation plays a small part in this bigger picture, and I want to be able to sure, make sure we get to your questions tonight. So thank you. I don't have a surgeon here, but what is liver resection described? I'm not sure who wants to take that. Yeah. All right. So there, there are multiple segments of the liver. Um, in the most extreme situation where a person is going to have a liver transplant, you can remove the whole liver and replace it with a donor liver. What we're talking about here is if a person has a single spot show up in the liver when every other area of disease is under control, we try and identify if we can take out a portion of the liver, a segment of the liver. So it is a major surgical procedure. There is morbidity associated with it. But we learned a long time ago that if a person has a solitary spot in the liver, and their colon cancer was taken care of two or three years beforehand, that if we take out that spot, the person may live for many more years. The idea being that the seed got up there when the original cancer was found and it's just been growing slowly over three to four years. If a person has multiple spots in the liver, we don't do that. It's, it's, you can't, there's a limit in how much liver you can actually take out, but a resection of the liver means taking out one small segment of the liver. Surgery was the first way, but now we have found that we can do many, many different things that avoid the use of surgery. We can use stereotactic radiation, which is what I was showing you. We can um, freeze it. We can heat it. We can, um, put, we can put a thin catheter into the blood supply that goes into the liver and inject it with chemotherapy directly into the tumor, or even take radioactive spheres and inject them directly into the tumor. They're all meant to try and destroy that portion of the liver that's been replaced by a spot of the tumor. Great. Thanks, Pat. Uh, how, how is circulating tumor cell detection performed? Yes, so this is really experimental, but it would be done by a blood test. Um, you know, we're not using this in clinical practice. It's really, really being researched, both in metastatic disease, to see if we could use that to monitor responses to therapy. Uh, you know, but the hopes would be that we could also bring this up to, to monitor patients who have had disease resected in stages uh, two, two and three. Excellent. Thank you. Courtney, do you want to take this one? Do genes change or mutate with age such that genetic testing should be repeated as a person ages? The germline testing. The germline testing we're talking about um, it would not change over time. So the genetic testing, if you did it, it wouldn't matter what age you did it at. The one thing to keep in mind is that testing technologies may have improved over time. So there's a small potential that there could be the specifics of that mutation may have been that it escaped detection on the testing technology at that time. And that you might detect it if you had updated testing. So it kind of depends on what genes we're talking about, what time frame you were tested. But the gene mutation, if it's there, it's there, and it's going to be there at whatever age you test. There's, there's one extra part of that. Some, sometimes another question is asked. A person may not understand whether we're testing your genes or the tumor's genes. Mm -hmm. So as we're monitoring a course of treatment, that tumor will have certain genetic mutations. As it progresses and goes through chemotherapy and comes back and back and back, there will be more and more and more mutations. And it may be very important to test the tumor's genetic mutations later to see if they've developed a new mutation that would make them respond to some of CC's therapies. Great. So to my colleagues, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying hard to group them. It's hard, but they're all good, and I know that you guys want them all answered. So I think uh, we've done well in answering them quickly, but let's just be mindful. We maybe have half an hour or a little more. So uh, let's try to give short answers to all of these. Um, if you had ovarian cancer and are now in remission, what frequency of colonoscopy should you have? I can comment on that, or do you want to comment, Courtney? I think part of it would be if we found a hereditary cause to the ovarian cancer, if we found a gene mutation that was associated with colon risk, like Lynch syndrome, that's going to inform the frequency. If we did not find a hereditary cause to the ovarian cancer, it would be dictated by family history. Yeah, I agree completely. So if there's no family history of colon cancer, it's ovarian cancer uh, by itself, then it would be average risk screening for colon. Start at 50, choose your modality. If it's colonoscopy, every 10. If it's Lynch syndrome, start at 25, every one to two years. 
How does consumption of red meat contribute to colon cancer or precancerous polyps? Cece, do you want to comment? Or do you want me to comment? I'll let you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> so it increases the risk. As you can imagine, it, it's, it's hard to measure very well. It's hard to tell people, don't eat red meat. I would say consume it in, in moderation. Uh, but it's not a tremendously strong risk factor. All of these things raise the risk by less than, than twofold, which is about the range of, of having a parent who had colon cancer in their 60s. You have about twice the lifetime risk. And we should have told you this if we didn't make it clear. If people live, live, live on and, and don't die very early from other things, the chance of getting colon cancer without screening for the average person is about 5 to 6%. So if you have a parent, it's maybe 10, 12% parent who had colon cancer, the red meat consumption doesn't get close to that. So it inches it up a little bit, but not tremendously. Oh, we have just five minutes. Oh, I thought we wanted to get to 8.30, sorry. Okay, does colon cancer show up on PET scan? Yes, it can. Could diverticulitis lead to colon cancer? No, but sometimes when people have diverticulitis, they say, get a colonoscopy, make sure we didn't miss anything. Is stool collection as thorough as colonoscopy in terms of finding polyps or tumors? As a wine type test, no. The stool DNA test may be 90%, the FIT test 70% for colon cancer. Uh, maybe Pat or Cece, what's the difference between colon and rectal cancer and does it matter? Location, location, location. <laughs> rectal cancer drains a different way, spreads a different way, colon cancer spreads a different way. So the therapies are different, um, but both require surgery. Excellent. Courtney. Please define strong family history. Does it include grandparents? Yes. <laughs> First, second degree, even into third degree relatives. We want to know about all of that. Uh, how do you differentiate the symptoms between colon, uh, I think this means colon cancer, and hemorrhoids? This probably reflects to, refers to rectal bleeding. If you have rectal bleeding, you can't always tell, except there are people who have had a lot of scant bleeding over a long period of time. Maybe that's hemorrhoids, but it could be something else. So I would say in the right age, get it checked out because uh, you can't completely be sure. You shouldn't bleed, basically. Yeah. How quickly can polyps grow into cancer? One month, six months, one year. Uh, the reality is from small polyp to cancer, we think is many years, maybe 10 years. So it can be quite a long time. Advanced polyps, maybe less. Except in one stone drain, it's faster. Correct, correct. Um, Cece, what, what vitamin D3 levels in serum are considered to decrease risk? Yeah, so I would say so. There, there hasn't been a study done where we randomize people to either taking vitamin D or not to see if, if taking vitamin D and raising your levels actually decreases the risk. But we know that pe people in, in population-based cohorts who have a higher level have a decreased risk. Um, I, can't, I can't quote you a number off the top of my head, but we're kind of inferring that by taking vitamin D, we may decrease that risk. Um, okay. Courtney? Uh, there was a question about BRCA1 and 2 and col colorectal cancer risk, and we don't think there's an association there. So again, it's similar to the other answer. If you had the BRCA mutation, no family history of colon cancer, you're going to be at average risk, average risk screening level. Uh, stool DNA tests, do they look for DNA of gut flora or what else? No, they look for changes that are along the lines of what Courtney was talking about in cancers. So these are changes in, in polyp DNA, essentially. Do flat polyps grow to look like the other polyps? No. They, they can be more mound-like, and they can sometimes lead to depressed cancers. Best way to find those probably is colonoscopy. What causes polyps to form? Bad chromosome pairs. If there's a genetic syndrome, yes. Sometimes there are acquired changes. So there is an acquisition of genetic changes, yes. Not always inherited. Pat, do you, do you guys have any others no, there? Uh, if cancer is found in ulcerative colitis during colonoscopy, does the whole colon have to be removed? Can, can it be treated with radiation or chemo? Uh, the primary management at that point is to remove the entire colon, and uh, chemotherapy may be indicated, radiation surgery is only. Surgery is usually avoided if a person has ulcerative colitis, because it can really activate it. And radiation only for rectal. Right, radiation is for rectal, not for colon. Do you want another one for that's, No, that's the one I heard. Uh, and preventive questions. What, what uh, role does the rate of bowel movements and flatulence play in the rates of colorectal cancer? None. 
So those symptoms, especially if they're chronic and stable, that's benign, no relationship. What are the relationships between the gut microbiome and colorectal cancer? Huge question. Uh, people wonder about this a lot. And the studies that have been done, you don't know whether the differences in, in the microbiome that are being reported are causing somebody's cancer or whether those bacteria colonize the cancer. So we don't yet know. Well, one reminder to everyone, there's a form here. We'd love to, if you could fill it out before you left so we can get some feedback on the, the structure of the night. It would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Great. Any other burning questions? Okay. So I hope we helped you understand the whole spectrum. One thing that we didn't make explicit is that the care of patients with colorectal cancer often requires multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, Cece mentioned the tumor board. Pat often participates to discuss what to do with radiation. Cece with oncology. Um, I, I, Courtney and I often deal with families who are at elevated risk trying to mitigate the risk of future cancers for the patient or for their relatives. And we hope that that showed through because we think that, that that's what people want for themselves and their families. Thanks for your interest and thanks for coming. One other, last question. Yeah, so that, that is reported as a high risk too. Probably similar to red meat alone. If you eat a lot of charred meat, there are carcinogens in there. It increases the risk. Probably not as much as family history, but if you're talking about risk reduction, everything in moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.